All right, everybody, let's get to it and pull that tarp. My guest today, Team USA bobsledder Sylvia Hoffman, a five-time World Cup medalist, three-time national champion, an international record holder, and Olympic hopeful for the 2022 Beijing Games coming up in February. Welcome to Everybody Pulls the Tarp, Sylvia. Hey, thank you for having me on, Andrew. Glad to be here. <laughs> I am so excited to sit down with you, Sylvia. Where I want to begin is something really unique about your story. Most Olympians train an entire lifetime in their sport to get ready for the Olympic Games. You just started bobsledding in 2018. How have you gone from starting a new sport in 2018 to being on the doorstep of an Olympic team in 2022? Oh man, that's hard work and effort right there. Uh, I'm also a three multi-sport athlete. So I've had three other sports to actually try to do this in. Um, actually bobsled is the third one. So I've had two other opportunities to make sure that I'm super fast, super strong, and then ready for an Olympic year. So I have my experience spread across different sports. And then this sport just happens to be one that like really highlights what I can do as an athlete. Now, bobsledding is a sport where, you know, especially Team USA has had a lot of success recruiting people from other sports and kind of converting them into bobsledders. What is it about what is it about the skills you need to be a successful bobsledder that you're able to draw from your success in other sports? Uh, well, my first sport was basketball. Uh, basketball, as we know it, has a little bit of everything. You have speed, agility, uh, jumping, diving. You have change of speed, change of direction. You have the strength areas. You have almost like a, uh, let's just say, a contact sport because you are actively touching other people, moving them out of your way, this, this, and that. So that particular sport, I think, really helped me have a good base for any sport that I wanted to do afterwards, uh, whether it continue to be basketball or something else like boxing or soccer or anything of that matter. Um, I was able to be uh, successful in anything after the sport. Um, and then I got into weightlifting right after college basketball. Um, I did eight years of Olympic weightlifting. I made three international teams with that. Um, and that experience with you know, like the strength and conditioning and then just learning the movements, uh, explosive movements, and then also being able to not have to sprint and jump and do all those things that I was doing in basketball. So in reality, I actually took eight years off of running, um, jumping, not so much because in weightlifting you do jump, but I took time off of sprinting and running and that wear and tear of those movements, I think really has made me successful in the sport because I'm able to come in fresh uh, as if, you know, like I never left uh, basketball or just say a, a running sport in general. So it's just been a really great combination coming from those, you know, like the explosive speed, agility sport. And then I went into strength conditioning, also um, strength based, speed based, explosive uh, movements. And now I'm in a sport where now I can actually start running, sprinting, jumping and doing all those things that I learned over my lifetime of sport. Uh, and I can just put it all in one, which is bobsled. So you competed on, on the Team USA's Next Olympic hopeful. That's where you get discovered as a, as a competitive bobsledder at this level. When someone presents the idea to you to come and test out your, your hand at bobsledding, what, what, what's going through your mind? How, how are you thinking about that, that, uh, that next step? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I was all about it. Um, I was kind of, I guess, keeping my head on the swivel because uh, I've always wanted to be an Olympian, represent my country. I've done it internationally, uh, but never on the Olympic stage. So I wanted to always either be in the military or be, uh, become an Olympian. And I am able to put myself in a position where the Olympic dream is is literally right there in my grasp. Um, so when the bobsled coaches chose me uh, to do a sports specific uh, pushing test on the push cart there in Colorado Springs. Um, I just went all out. Uh, that's all I could do is I was like, look, you're, I think I was 28 at the time. I was like, look, you're 28, you're switching sports, weightlifting. Obviously you're probably not going to make that Olympic team. I was like, you have to do something. You either go all out or you go home. And I chose to go all out and I pressed the coaches and they invited me out to Lake Placid, New York, where I am right now, uh, actually. And 
Uh, I just did my best there at the push championships with the rookie push champs, national push championships, team trials, you name it. Like they said, hey, let's let's see how fast you are on dry land. And then I was able to prove how fast it was. And then they said, well, hey, let's see how fast you're on ice. And then I was able to prove how fast that was. And I broke a standard and created a new standard for the upcoming break women to come in and say, well, hey, you, if you're not hitting these numbers, then you know, the likely chance of you making a World Cup team is, you know, like not as great. So, you know, being able to do that coming into the sport, uh, not knowing anything about it was like huge for me. Um, and then I was able to prove the same thing on the World Cup level. Go all out or go home. I like that. I like that <laughs> mindset. Sylvia, is that is that always been a mindset of yours? Is that something that's been with you your your whole life that you're going to put everything into something or or you're, you're not going to be a part of it? Um, yeah, I want to say for the most part, um, it ha it has kind of like been that thing of like, hey, you're either going to do it or you're not. Um, I'm a big fan of not wasting people's time nor my own. So whenever I go out and do something, especially when I choose it and I say, hey, this is what I want to do. That is me committing to not only myself, but the people around me that are also involved in whatever it is that I want to do. Um, so I've always just kind of had that thing of like, hey, you got this you, you, you can do this, be that person that like leads the way, like just try to have like the positive mindset of things and not like, like bashing myself, like, Hey, you know, I don't know if you can do this, but you, maybe you'll try like, no, it's like, go out there, give it your all, see if you're good at it. And if you are just, just take control of it and let, just, let's go ham. Let's, let's just, let's just go ham on it. So um, I, I just, I believe in doing my best no matter what. Um, and then doing my best, to the best of my abilities. Um, that's the best thing that you can do for yourself and for the people that are around you. So that's what I go for on a regular basis. What, what was the biggest surprise when you got into bobsledding? Oh, so I didn't know that it would feel the way it felt going down a hill. So uh, in bobsled, we're going down an icy track. Um, you can even think of it like a half pipe, so, so to speak. So you're going down this mile long track. Uh, you're in a bobsled. Uh, as a brakeman, you don't see anything. So I'm used to visualization. I'm used to seeing where I'm going. I'm, I'm used to like being able to, you know, intake all these things within my eyes. But with bobsled as a brake woman, I'm not able to do those things. So I was just like, oh my gosh, I don't know where I am. Oh my goodness. Like, why do I feel that? Why do I feel this? Oh my goodness. You know, like it's just a ride and you have to get used to it. Like even now it's like, I'm that much better because I have three and a half years of experience of it. But if you take a driver that has never been a brakeman or been in the back, uh, I had a friend from Germany that said that she's, she did that. She took a trip after never being in a brake position in two years. Um, and then she took a trip and she said, oh my gosh, like, I don't know how you guys do it. She's like, I didn't know where I am. And like, I know the tracks, like the back of my hand is I've driven all of these tracks in the world. But yet when I got back there, I didn't know anything. And she's like, and I felt these things, like I felt the sled and it was moving weird. And it's like one of those things you just have to get used to. So that was my biggest, biggest takeaway from entering the sport. And then the second one was just, I didn't know that bobsled was such a, like a, a, a blue collar sport. Uh, we do nearly all the sled work. We don't have a pit crew. So a lot of people think that we show up to the track and we have this crew kind of like NASCAR or something, and they're doing all the work for us. They have like tons of mechanics and they're doing all the work for us. And we just warm up, get ready, push the sled and jump in. But that's not how it works in bobsled. Bobsled, we're the ones that work on the sled. We take care of it. We get it to the line. We transport it from one location to another, you know, like we're, we're loading it up in the sled truck. We're unloading everything, creating a garage and a parking lot, like in a parking garage. And we're just saying, Hey, this is where we train. This is where we work on our sleds. And we're just going like, to make the most of it and then go out there and compete against the world. So that was the, those two things I had no idea this sport had going on for it, but it's definitely been a challenge, but I've, I've been all in. It's like, you either, you're either here or you're not, you know, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? You know, you can't just waste your, your years away just saying, ah, I'm just going to do this for fun. Mm -mm, nope. <laughs> I'm all about it. I'm all about it. That, that story about the blue Kyle, the blue collar nature of bobsledding is just perfect for this show because this show is called everybody pulls the tarp. It's all based upon a, a mindset and a <laughs> philosophy that I have that great teams, great organizations are powered by individuals who contribute in unexpected ways. They do things that 
maybe aren't in their job description. They don't think there's any task beneath them. They're willing to do whatever mm -hmm. it takes in the moment to help the team. For, for you and your teammates, that's taking care of the sled, setting up the garage, cleaning up the garage, getting ready for practice. It's not just, you know, glamorous, you know, hop into the bobsled and, and let it rip. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> and it's also cold. So that's like another element to it all. It's a winter sport um, that takes place about like six months out of the year as far as like preparations. Um, each location in the world has a different winter season. Some start early and finish early. Some start early and finish late. Uh, but we have a six-month time frame uh, without, within the whole world itself to figure out how we're going to get better at bobsled itself. Um, it requires snow, ice. Well, it requires ice. Um, and if it's too warm, the ice on the track will melt. The ice conditions are terrible. You can damage your equipment, things of that nature. Like It just gets dangerous. So we have to do it during the winter. It's not something that we can just do in the middle of the summer where we can just get we get better all year round. It's something where like we have to do this in the winter time. Um, now, as a break woman and they're you know break men, um, we have this opportunity of being able to get better throughout the entire year because it only requires pushing. Your your it requires your athleticism and it requires pushing. Um, and you can do that anywhere. You can do that at the gym. You can do it uh, in, on a field at the track. You can do it anywhere. You can find a, a push track. We have push tracks here in Lake Placid. Uh, we have a dry land and an ice, uh, and a, a ice track, an ice push track. And then we also, I think, are getting one built out in Park City, Utah, I believe. Uh, so we're going to have, like, I guess, a total of three push tracks available here in the United States. And I mean, in North America itself, that's what, maybe a total of four, because we're talking about Canada. So like, it's, it's one of those things where you can get better but you have to get better at pushing, not just sprinting, not just lifting, but by pushing an object because it requires a different amount of energy throughout your entire body. I kid you not, you can blow yourself up in six hits and you're going to be like, what? I thought I could do like 15, but no, you can't. <laughs> so it's just, it's a different beast um, as a, as a brakeman and it's a whole different skill level as a pilot. It's so interesting, Sylvia. What about the analytics and the video, like in other sports? Is is there a role for that in bobsled? Are you spending time looking at an iPad, watching uh, video of, of, of your bobsled runs? Are you spending time with data? W w talk about that for a minute. <laughs> oh, definitely. So I'm uh, definitely an analytical uh, person. Uh, I love technology. I love IT. I'm an engineer. Uh, I love learning in that particular way because visualizing something and seeing what's going on can make the difference of you winning a race or losing a race. Uh, so in bobsled, uh, let's just start from the brakeman to the pilots. We film our we film our uh, our pushes. Uh, we film our pushes. We film our drives. Uh, down the track, uh, because the track is so long, it's about a mile long, you have to stand in a curve. So that also makes it a, a little bit more difficult for the pilots because you can only stand in so many curves <laughs> and it's cold and all the, all the above. So, you know, you pick a curve, you stand at it and you just watch the sleds go by you. It's really quick, like as a, a blink of an eye, let's just say, um, the sled will go by. So you have to be quick with that. Uh, pushing wise, you can get a little bit more film with that. Uh, start ramps are generally about, um, let's just say from the first, from the start block to the timing iron to the first curve is about 50 meters. Um, the start block to the first timing is 15. So you have a time from 15 to 50 meters, but the grooves in the ice where the sled sits on, um, there's grooves so that the sled won't go like this as you're pushing it and it'll just stay straight in a, in a straight line. So the grooves end typically about 35 meters down the crest. You know, that's not that long. <laughs> so you're pushing for about 30 meters, 30 to 35 meters or whatever. And then you're jumping in, getting down, the pilot's getting ready, and now you're going into the track. So all of that, that's your film. And then the rest of it is down the track. <laughs> so it's like, it, it requires precision. Um, and each track in the world, they have cameras set up at, um, I want to say at each curve. So you can kind of see the entrance and the exits of each curve. So you're, the, the pilots are not only getting things from the outside of the track where someone is filming, but they're also getting stuff from the inside of the track. Um, but we can't necessarily have too many um, filming devices on our sleds. So again, we're limited to in some capacity, but it's like you make do with, uh, with what you have 
and everyone in the sport knows like this is what we can do this is what it requires so we'll have to just do several trips to get that perfect line to get the fastest line down the track what is the what is the process in terms of like goal setting in bobsled how, how do you are you are you breaking it down into small chunks are you are you really just working towards an improved time how, how are you going about setting goals individually and as a as a unit Oh, uh, so I, I, I honestly believe it depends on the person and how they learn. Uh, each person learns a little different, whether uh, it's by vision, feeling, hearing. Um, usually, if you can combine those three things, you're able to learn just like that. Uh, but your learning capacity, too, is also a factor. So depending on what you're working on. So a new like, let's just say if someone wanted to join bobsled. Uh, the first thing we show them is the push track. We say, hey, here's a dry land push track. This is this, this sled that's on rails, and all you have to do is push it to go forward. Uh, we'll show them how to, uh, how to set up in their start position. We'll show them what their legs are supposed to be doing when they hit the sled, and then we'll just kind of just let them go. So it's, it's like a progression type of thing with anything that you do. You have to progress into something that's a little bit more difficult than what someone else. So like a new person, they might be working on their hit, you know, just trying to get their knees into the sled and just dropping in and hitting the sled, as opposed to someone that's like, you know, a year or two in, they're just looking at their sprint techniques, their sprint mechanics going down the crest. So it just depends on what you're working on and just making sure you're setting your goals where like you're not doing something that you're not ready for. So it's almost like a progression type of thing. And each person has like their own set of goals. Some people are really good at sprinting, so they don't necessarily have to worry about their sprint mechanics and what they look like. They just have to know what position they need to be in and then just do it. Uh, people with more uh, that don't necessarily have like the strength base, they're going to have to figure out how to get the sled going to the best of their ability without, you know, like we say, getting dragged by the sled. It's when you when you hit the sled and then you kind of fall, but you don't fall and keep going forward running, you fall and your legs are dragging. So it's like, it's one of those things is like, we say, don't get dragged <laughs> because it's like, that means you like just really messed up bad. Um, but there's been people that come back from that. Uh, we have like a silver medalist from last year. Like she even has it posted on her IG and, you know, she started out and she wasn't doing that well pushing, but she ended up being, you know, a silver medalist at the 2018 um, Pyeongchang Games. So it's like, it doesn't matter where you start as long as you have a plan and know what you want to do and know what you want to accomplish at the end of it. And just making sure you're hitting those milestones to make sure you're like hitting that goal at the end of the day. You're, you're, doing, you're doing something, you know, that you know, it, many would fear, right? You're, you're hopping into the, a sled and you're riding it <laughs> downhill on ice. You're you're trying to make incremental you know improvements to to your ability, working very hard under a lot of pressure. What what about the mental side of it? Is 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 there work that's being put in you know from a sports psychology mental skills perspective? Oh yeah, uh, we have uh, we have a. Um a sports psychologist on site here in Lake Placid uh, named Dr. Mara. She's amazing. She she makes sure that she keeps in touch with all the athletes. Uh, this doesn't matter which sport that comes up here, biathlon, uh, the aerialist, uh, bobsled skeleton luge, uh, gymnastics, it doesn't matter. Uh, she's a sports psychologist and she's here for us to make sure that we're getting exactly what we need out of the sport and we're not like killing ourselves mentally in the process. Uh, Cause I think positive, staying positive in all aspects um, can affect your mental health. Um, we, she's made sure that she was available during like the COVID stuff when people are in lockdowns, she's in our chats, like, Hey, you know, like I'm here if you need me you know, to reach out, you know, if we're coming back into town, she's like, she wants to touch bases with us to make sure that we're getting what we need. We have our goals set where we are mentally and physically. And then that way, if she needs to, um, convey to the coaches, like, Hey, this athlete, you know, like, this is what they need. You know, this is what they told me that they need from you. And she's able to converse with them on a different level. So then that way everyone understands like what each party needs. So she's amazing. I'm really glad. And I, I feel like I'm super blessed, at, especially at this stage in life, to even be able to work with a sports psychologist. Uh, I believe we need more of them out there. Uh, and I also believe like if I had one when I was younger, man, there's there's no telling. Heck, I, might, I probably would have stayed in basketball. You never know. So it's uh, it's one of those things where it's like the help, like if there's help, use it. 
don't be afraid to use it because I know back in the day you hear the word psychologist and you know people would be like, oh my gosh, you're seeing a psychologist and did this and this and you know it was never like looked at as a good thing as far as mental health is concerned. But nowadays people are a little bit more enlightened of like, hey, you know what, I actually do need to take care of myself. Uh, these things do matter. It does matter if I'm feeling down and this, this and that, or if I'm feeling happy and I want to actually like tell other people about it. Um, so just you know like having someone available. I think in it's it just has made the world of difference for not just athletes but coaches uh, within each federation and each sport. I, I I think you know certainly people like Simone Biles and Michael Phelps and others have have done such a great job to to shine a light on on the the important topic of mental health, especially for uh, athletes everywhere, for people everywhere, but in particular Olympic athletes. I think people so often see an Olympian standing on the podium getting their gold medal, and they have really very little appreciation for the work, uh, both physically and mentally, that went into that and what, what, you know, what those individuals go through. So it's such an important topic. You've mentioned a few times, Sylvia, you're in Lake Placid, you're training. Everybody's wondering, you know, who, who listens to this show, we're about three months or so away from the Olympics. Hopefully you're going to be in Beijing. What, what does a day look like right now for Sylvia Hoffman? Uh, right now, we are scrambling to make sure that we have everything that we need for tour. Uh, a bunch of us leave out on the 12th of November, which is like less than 10 days, something like that. <laughs> so right now, it's like, you know, last minute training, uh, fine tuning, because we can't necessarily do too much. I mean, we've spent all summer uh, training and competing. So now it's kind of like we have to like, dial it back a little bit, but then also make sure that we're still ready for tour because this year it's like every World Cup, they're looking at, you know, what we're doing, our performance, how do we measure up to the field? What did you do this year versus any other race you've ever done uh, within the Federation? So it's like all eyes are, you know, pretty much on team selection on the athletes, you know, health stability. Are they able to, you know, like still perform under certain pressures? Um, a bunch of us have like the media summits and, uh, and things that were going over the last two weeks. Uh, so it's kind of like last minute, you know, fine tuning with, you know, like training, what you need as far as like if you have to buy supplements, uh, because this year was a little different. Um, all of our sleds got shipped to China. Um, so it went straight to China and their rules were that we couldn't have any food or liquids in the in the crates, which sucked because we usually put our supplements and things that we actually don't need <laughs> on the plane inside the crates. So because of that, we weren't, we were, we're like, now we're like, well, we have extra bags, you know, now we have to make sure we have room for our supplements, uh, whether it be powders or tablets, um, electronics, headphones. I still need to buy like two more sets of headphones. I just lost a pair. So it's like, I want to make sure that I'm ready and prepared for the season because we have four months ahead of us. Um, and our Christmas break, we have like a week off, um, but a bunch of us are not coming back to the States this year. So that's a world of difference too. We're gonna stay out in Europe um, because it's just better for the, the mind, the body to recover instead of traveling back to the States and then turn around and like what, two, two and a half, three days and then coming back to Europe. Um, I, we just think that it's, it's just, it's too much money and too much energy. So the best thing that we can do for ourselves is to just stay in Europe, get some rest, recover. And then our first World Cup after Christmas is in um, Segulda, Latvia. So it's like, we have all these things going on. Uh, I mean, I have, I had a two a day today. I have training tomorrow. I have another training session. I have a sleep study on Friday. So it's, it's like, it's crunch time. We don't have time to do like, you know, like run around and stuff. It's like, what do you need to do? Okay, let's do this. So I'm really glad that you and I were able to like really squeeze this in because I was like, I don't know what's up, what's going on. The schedules are all crazy. There's no ice time available. You know, people are trying to slide down the track. We got little crates. It's it's just it's it's like a I'm not gonna say a hurricane, but it's something like that. Um, up until we're ready to go to Europe. We we've been we've been talking about doing this for a while, Sylvia. I am so glad <laughs> that we're getting to have this this that we're getting to have this this conversation <laughs> you mentioned the sleep study okay i want i want to unpack a few things there so sleep study sleep i mean obviously i mean we talked about the mental side of things the physical side of things sleep how how big of a role you know is sleep playing in recovery 
Oh, it's a, it's a huge role. Um, I've always known that I've had like some type of sleep apnea, but I didn't know how bad it was. And our uh, great, like our great sports med team, they've been trying to look out for, you know, not just me, but the other athletes. And I told them like, well, Hey, I was like, I'm having these troubles sleeping. I was like, you know, like, I, I feel like I feel good, but then other days I feel, I don't feel like I feel good. Um, so they said, well, Hey, let's take a deep dive. Uh, I've seen a pulmonologist. Uh, so they've been looking into like what my breathing is like lately. Uh, the sleep study, I mean, honestly, it's been rescheduled twice. <laughs> it's been rescheduled twice. And I think it was supposed to be Friday, but now it's Thursday of this week. So I'm like, oh my gosh, uh, I just want to do this so I can figure this out. Um, so they're they're just trying to make sure that like I'm getting that the right recovery in um, and that I'm actually sleeping because as of right now, I am, every time I go to sleep, I'm actually waking up right afterwards. Um, so I'm really not sleeping and I can't tell the difference because I'm so used to it. So I'm really excited that they were able to get me into this, this study because I'm like, I need to know, we need to know, do I need a CPAP? Do I need surgery? What's going on? You know, and, and what do we have time for right now? Um, but we're trying to do it all. And, uh, so far so good. Um, it's just a matter of planning and then just kind of just doing it. Sylvia, you're, you're so close to achieving, you know, a goal, something that's been a goal of yours for so long, you know, becoming an Olympian, competing in an Olympic Games, even though you didn't maybe 20 years ago expect that it might be in bobsledding, you're still really <laughs> close. You're, you're, you're still really close to achieving that dream. How do you, really close, really close, how do you, how do you process that? And how do you deal with, you know, the, not creating too much pressure for yourself? Um, well, I have a, a good, let's just say a good team around me. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things uh, with that's in relation to success is have is the people that are around you. Um, so over the years, I've been able to meet some amazing people, teammates, coaches, you name it. I have family that are super supportive and in what, whatever I do. Um, so my previous coach, uh, Zygmunt Smallsers, he was our um, high no, not high performance. He was our national team uh, and head coach for USAW. Um, he's now the head coach of Norway's Federation, um, and he was great. Like I, we we worked together initially. He's like, hey, you should be hitting these numbers. Why aren't you doing this? I was like, I don't know, you know. And it was it was one of those things where I was just like, I didn't know so many things. But he's also a very technical person. So he was able to sit me down one day. He's like, hey this is what you're doing. This is what you're doing wrong. <laughs> and it was, it took that, that moment to say, Hey, you're doing this wrong to, for me to just be like, I didn't know that because no one had told me I was doing certain things wrong. So he's like, if you do these things like this, you could be a world champion. You could be an Olympian. You could be an Olympic champion. I'm like, wow, no one told me that let's do this. And so I asked him like, Hey, let's, let's take care of it. Um, so he's been like pretty much the, he's still my coach to this day. Um, he, we talk, you know, every so often he sends me my program, uh, every day that I need it. Um, and it's just like one of those things where it's like, you have people in your corner that are going to make sure that you're on the right track for success. Uh, he's an Olympic champion. Uh, the Brakeman coach that I'm working with as well. He's a German guy. He's from Germany, two-time Olympic champion as well. He's a bobsledder. Um, so it's like when you're surrounding yourself with people that have done what you're trying to do, you're more likely to achieve that as well. Um, and it's the same thing in business. So I try to surround my, my, myself with people of uh, a like mindset um, that are positive, that are go-getters, that don't make excuses for what they can't do. Because at the end of the day, there's always somebody that's able to do it. And it's like, well, why are they able to do this, but you're not? So I just try not to make excuses for you know, anything is like, well, there's, there's always going to be something, but it's like, but there's always a way to get past that something that's, that's holding you back. Um, so I just try to stay focused. Um, this year has been pretty crazy with everything, but as far as like, I'm concerned, like I learned so much in weightlifting, uh, that I didn't learn in basketball. And then at, also as an adult, it's like, okay, I get it now. I know how to stay focused. I know how to like remove myself from situations that are like, unnecessarily stressful that's you know killing my energy you know things of that nature because like if you're not protecting your energy you're 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 uh let's just say you paying attention your ability to pay attention to what needs to be done tends to get diminished so i'm like well hey you know what 
I need to make sure I'm protecting my energy, staying positive, staying around people with like mindsets. Like, I don't want to hear someone complaining for an hour about how hard something is. I'm like, well, you're in here, you're doing it. It's only as hard as you think it is. Um, I mean, I used to tell myself in weightlifting, this, this weight isn't heavy. And you know what? I ended up squatting double body weight not too long after that. So it's like, if you're preparing yourself to be successful for what you want to do, then it's, it's so much easier to do it. I mean, if you're not, if you're going to doubt yourself, you're probably not going to be successful, but if you're going to like lift yourself up mentally, man, there's, there's no telling what you can reach with that. You have, you have such an, you know, an inspi inspiring, elevating, positive mindset, Sylvia. I have had so much fun. I am so glad that we got to have <laughs> this conversation. Good. Of course. Good luck the next, good luck the next few months with everything. We're all going to be rooting for you. Best of Yay. luck getting to uh, get into Beijing and uh, keep pulling the tarp. All right, Sylvia. I appreciate it all day, every day. <laughs> all right. Take, take care, my friend. We'll talk soon. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me on as well.